There's several large pieces here. Um, like I say, investigative pieces. But I also pulled out um, another one here, which is the leader is Fukushima coverage and the TikTok, <coughs> which is an actual email I found from when we were doing this coverage um, in, the, in the middle of um, the Fukushima coverage. That was the calling of a, a morning news meeting that day, and this was the, um, the content of it. So I thought that might be helpful um, for those of you who haven't worked in large newsrooms or you're used to working you know, uh, freelance. This is some examples of how we, how we ran the morning meetings in the middle of all of the uh, chaos. So I'll say a few things about that as well. But, um, But that's the basic two handouts you have. So I sh if I was more digitally savvy, I would have all these you know, screens with what have you up there, which you could see it, but I'm afraid I brought it all down just to text on paper. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll take it from there. And you can take the, particularly the story package, you can take that away with you, of course, and read the stories. Um, if you've got any feedback on them or any other questions, I, you can let me know. I've got so. Should we kick off or? All right. Those that are late have missed their deadline. Okay, so um, thanks everyone for coming today. Um, my name is Peter Langan. I'm the current president of this club. And as you probably saw from the handout, uh, I've been in journalism mostly in Asia for about 30 odd years and I spent about 20 years at Bloomberg and it was at Bloomberg where most of these uh, stories were done uh, so um, before I drop into them oh fruit sand's gone uh, is she there could you just well actually it's okay uh, it's okay yeah I just want to do my little pitch for the club, if you're not a member. <laughs> but Faruta San, the lady who gave you the package when you came in, she has uh, details on membership of the club. You know, there are special deals for younger members, students, and such like. Uh, so she can uh, fill you in on that uh, if you wish to have any more information. You know, the club has got a you don't know it has a uh, library upstairs and um, uh, real-time news services it's got uh, Reuters and Kyodo a lot of research uh, papers books magazines and also a work area so it's a uh, it's a place where journalists can actually work upstairs as well as down here this area these walls come down it's where we have our main press conferences and also the main bar, which is down towards the end there. Um, okay, so I was uh, on a bus the other day coming through Shibuya, and I was thinking about this presentation because I haven't done a presentation for a, like this for a number of years. I'm wondering what to say. And it was one of those moments where I, the bus stopped at a traffic light and I turned to the right, and there was a, a lady standing there in a long green smock dress with this signage on the top in brown lettering that said um, attitude makes the difference so which I thought hmm that uh, yeah that makes that makes sense then the bus pulled into the depot and as I was getting off there was another lady standing there 
and she was wearing a t-shirt with um, some white lettering on it that said let me show you how it's done so that to me sort of struck me as the two perhaps messages um, I was uh, I should consider but attitude is one thing I do wish to uh, talk about because it's very very important in a newsroom um, because there's all kinds of things uh, particularly in this kind of coverage, disaster coverage, that will combine to make your life very, very difficult. So um, the things I'm going to talk about tonight, uh, I'm not going to give you any magic bullet, because to my knowledge there isn't one in news coverage. You just have to get back to the basic fundamentals um, of news coverage. People say that news or journalism has changed so much in the last 20 years or so because of the advent of the internet. But in actual fact, journalism hasn't changed. You know, the tools have changed, the platforms have changed, and so on. But fundamentally, journalism has not changed. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that and the the fundamentals. There's three uh, specific items I'm going to talk about, although as I just mentioned to you, those who came earlier, I'm going to cut out the section on um, the collapse of the Suharto government in um, Indonesia in uh, 1998, because we just don't have time to do it. But if there's time later, we can come back to it. Uh, then we're going to look at the um, the Deepwater Horizon, which was an oil well that I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with. Um, but in April 20, 2010, it exploded. It killed 11 people in the Gulf of Mexico working on the platform. And it caused the biggest oil spill in U.S. history. Uh, I was uh, called in to help work on that. I was working out of Houston in Texas with some reporters. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about the particular difficulties of that story. And um, then, of course, Fukushima. With the, the triple disasters, we know the earthquake, the tsunami, and then the nuclear disaster, and how to um, cover those things, uh, the different challenges of those stories and how we uh, approach them. So I said earlier that journalism, journalism hasn't really changed. And uh, the point I'm trying to get at is, as I said, the platforms have shifted. The means, we have these incredible tools, journalists and everybody else, for sending headlines and reading stuff and so on. But fundamentally, it hasn't changed. And the fundamental rule of journalism, which is a, a cliche, but is still fundamentally true, is that as a journalist, you are only as good as your sources. As I say, it's uh, a cliche, you'll hear lots of people say it, but it's fundamentally true. You're only as good as the sources you have. And it applies to every kind of uh, news coverage. Um, there's a lot of news coverage that is dished up to you on a plate. Um, there's one. Uh, there's one term in in news news wire uh, offices that talk about the show up and throw up. Has any of you ever heard that term? Show up and throw up. I'm not talking physically now. So it refers to the, the journalist. If you go to a press conference or you get a press release, you're at your desk, you write up the press release, da 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 da, -da. you send it to your editor who runs a spell check on it, and then out it goes and you know, onto the ether, the web or the wire service, whatever it might be, newspaper. We call it show up and throw up. Um, you're just taking something that's handed to you, as I say, whether it's a press conference, a press release, you massage it a little bit, 
editor and out. That's not the kind of journalism I'm, I'm talking about here. Anybody can basically do that. Um, this is where, and, and you could say that that press release you, you get or the press conference you attend, that is just the beginning. It's just the beginning of, of journalism. I mean, there are, of course, exceptions like when you, um, you're given um, you know, a straight piece of news on a press release that just needs to go out. But this is, I'm talking about investigative work here. And to do that, you have to have uh, your sources. Those sources, you could say, um, regardless of the type of coverage you're doing, but particularly so in, in disaster coverage, you can sum it up as the, the human... The human is the verb. It's the verb that will make your story work, in which you can hang your story, uh, and that is what will will make the difference. So, to stress the point again, journalism at its core has not changed. It's getting those sources, authoritative sources, eyewitness sources in the cases of what we're talking about with disasters um, survivors of those disasters and other people directly connected in some way it's finding out who those people are and then being able to talk to them and then to get them to go on the record and tell you what happened and then you can uh, start to build your story around that. So um, I mentioned something earlier about attitudes. So there's two things we can do here. Uh, we can talk about attitudes, but I also had a, a couple of notes here about practicalities, as in how do you cover it, how do you prepare for a disaster? Do you, I, I'm not sure what your preference is. Um, do you want to hear about the practicalities of when Fukushima happened, what was lacking, what we needed to go and do the coverage, uh, or talk about attitudes that help you as a journalist. What, what do, you, do you want to hear about the practicalities, or do you want to hear about attitudes? Don't be shy. Practicalities, yeah? Okay, we'll try that. Um, the first thing that hit with Fukushima was, the, of course, uh, a vehicle. How do you get there? Uh, for those of you who are here, um, the train shut down. Um, a lot of the roads were damaged. They got shut down by the police in certain areas. Uh, so what the means of transport? So the first thing was, as a journalist, how do you get there? Um, so at Bloomberg, we didn't have a vehicle prepared. I do know that there are news organizations. I was told that AP, for example, does have a vehicle on hand, ready to go. And inside that vehicle is things like uh, extra gasoline. You need a gasoline tank that you can fill up because when you go into a disaster zone, you can't assume you're going to be able to get gasoline. You need to stock it up with lots and lots of water. You need food, of course, uh, perhaps dried food initially, but then other food when you actually take off. And the one big thing that haunts you as a journalist in a disaster zone begins with B, <laughs> and it starts for, stands for batteries. Having batteries is like the bane of your life because, again, you're in a disaster zone where you may not have access to power. You may not have access to food, access to gasoline, access to water. So they're the things, the basics you need to take with you. So if you are in a position of needing to go and cover a, cover a disaster, you need to get a car. Uh, one tip I could give you is try and find a vehicle that has the... Um, you know uh, these plugs you have in a wall, AC plugs? 
there are cars you can get now that have got AC chargers in them, two two prong plugs like that, and so you can plug in an extension cord, and then everyone have access for charging up batteries, backup batteries, and your phone, because again, cell phone networks go down in disasters, like they did here, um, and also the authorities shut down cell phone networks as well because they want they don't want a massive overload of traffic to cause the cell phone network to crash uh, so they shut them down and that's so is that emergency services can use them and um, you don't have access I mean journalists do if you're from a bona fide organization they do have an access that's left open um, but anyway, you do need uh, to make sure your cell phones and all the batteries that you might need because as the networks come back up and as you cover the issue, uh, to cover the event, um, believe me, you can never have enough batteries. Um, uh, there's a lot of basic things. Uh, clothing is one thing. You've got to think about where you're going, taking enough clothing. When I went up to Fukushima, it was uh, several days after the first event, the, the um, earthquake, sorry, and tsunami. And I grabbed two reporters and I told them we're going up to Fukushima. And they went home and I said, you know, grab a bag of stuff and let's go. So I picked them up later. Um, but one of the reporters, um, if you want the real details here, only brought one pair of underpants because he insisted to me after the fact that I told him we're only going for one night when in fact we went for several. So he would take off his underpants at night and then turn them around and put them back on again the next day and then turn them around and put them back on again the next day. So not exactly pleasant. Um, and when you're in a, a disaster zone where you can't shower and wash and stuff like that, so taking off clothes as well, think about weather. Um, uh, if you're a journalist going up into those areas, besides um, a passport, you need to bring every type of journalist ID you have and Meishi or whatever it might be, because the police uh, block the roads and they put up uh, traffic jams. Uh, sorry, uh, traffic stops. Uh, so they won't let you through unless you've got a reason for going into the disaster zone. So in our case, we were stopped by the police and we had our journalism ID and so on. So, But before they would let us through, they checked the car and they made sure we had extra gasoline in a, in a red you know, tank that we could carry, food and water and so on. So again, if the police think that you're not prepared, they won't let you through. Because what will happen is if you go through and you don't have water, food or gasoline, whatever, and you get stuck somewhere, then you become part of the problem. And so they won't uh, allow you through if, if you're not properly prepared and you can show them. So you need to make sure you have um, those things. Um, Another thing is, um, I guess some of you have heard the saying, uh, getting, um, what is the term? Getting forgiveness is always easier than getting permission. When we went up into Fukushima, there was lots of areas that were cordoned off in the no the no go zone, the radiation zone, but we went in to those areas. Uh, you know, you've got to break rules basically uh, in order to get to places where other aspects of the story might be happening. Uh, and like I say, getting forgiveness. If you ask for permission, you won't get it. Reporters called me when I was in Tokyo, and they were at a place where. They had gotten around the, uh, the people who were manning the bar barriers into the no-go zone. Uh, they'd found a place where the barriers were not actually manned. 
And so they asked me if uh, they could go in. But we had a standing rule from the New York newsroom that no, you couldn't because it was a radiation zone and you couldn't go in there. So I told them I didn't hear that request, um, but I'll give you uh, forgiveness later. So you do, you do have to break uh, some rules in, in journalism. Uh, another thing is Japan often has, uh, yeah, Japan recommends people to have an earthquake bag, right? Something you can grab in the event of an earthquake and um, water, etc. inside. The same thing is true for journalists. It's good to have a journalism bag just with a lot of basic things that you can grab and take with you. Uh, but that's just some of the um, uh, practicalities of preparing for it. But the nature of these events is that in some ways it's very difficult to prepare. You can do a lot of this basic stuff, but um, yeah, it's, it's very difficult to, to prepare for everything that might happen. Uh, does every, anybody here not know what Murphy's Law is? Murphy's Law? You don't know Murphy's Law, okay. Thank you for putting your hand up. <laughs> Murphy's Law is says that whatever can go wrong will go wrong. But if you spend a number of years as a journalist and particularly trying to cover these types of events, you'll find that actually Murphy is an optimist. Whatever can go wrong, will go wrong, all of the time, when you least expect it, when you've checked it five times, it will still go wrong. When the people have told you that they've checked it and everything's okay, and yes, we have a full tank of gasoline in the car, and then you leave, and there's no gasoline places open, and then you'll find actually you don't have any gasoline in the car, and you've got to go and find some. So Murphy's Law runs rampant during coverage of uh, disaster experiences, so uh, be warned um, about that. The other thing I found uh, is that if you go as a journalist off into a disaster zone, you've got support people back in your newsroom, right? If you're, again, working for a news organization or even if you're freelance, if you've got a commission to go into a disaster zone and produce a story, there's somebody who's commissioned you to do that story, an editor, a magazine, a website, whatever it is. So you've got people to report back to. And you would think that those people are the ones you can come to depend on, to assist you, uh, to help you. Um, but I can tell you that that is not always the case. In fact, you'll find often you will succeed despite your leadership, not because of it. People will start to interfere with your stories. You'll have, in my case, I had a case, uh, editors in New York who were dictating story situations to me when I just got the situation from the reporter on the ground in the, in the actual disaster zone, but people somewhere else have concepts or ideas, per perceptions about what it's like and will sometimes try and impose that upon you and your work. Uh, so that can actually, your fight becomes not just with the disaster itself and covering it, but also with the people who are supposed to be helping you cover it. Um, so if you're not depressed already by this uh, presentation, you should be by now. Um, the other thing I found, and again, for those of you who've worked in newsrooms, when a disaster happens, the, the impulse is to go straight at it. Because if, in the case again of Fukushima, the earthquake happens, and if you're a journalist, in, in the newsroom I was in, which was a wire service, the first thing was you've got to send a headline. You've got to tell the world this big earthquake has just gone off and buildings in Tokyo are shaking. You don't know the magnitude typically in the moment, but you've got to get the headline out. 
then you've got to fill that headline then you've got to fill the headline means to send a a short story a paragraph that illustrates what's what's happening and then you've got to get reporters on the phone or checking websites and so on to find out what was the magnitude of that where was it does everyone know the the USGS website the USGS website is based in the United States and it it basically monitors earthquakes all around the world and gives out readings for them. I mean, Japan, of course, is very advanced in its earthquake um, coverage, but it, it uses a different measure, which can initially be confusing. But the USGS does the, the globally recognized uh, magnitude uh, reading on a quake and where it is, and also its depth and so on, because the depth of a quake is very important. You can have a very strong quake, but if it's very, very deep, you don't he feel that much of it. So those, you need to get that information and then start pumping out those headlines and so on to, f to the story. But what then happens, and I've seen this happen so many times in newsrooms over so many issues, is everybody then charges forward to cover the story that's right in front of them. But one thing you need to do is actually look back um, and look around you. And what by that I mean, whatever story you're covering, there is always uh, somewhere work that's been done, other reporting, research, something that will help you in the story that you're trying to do. So, so many times over so many issues, I've seen newsrooms in all kinds of breaking news. You know, Prime Minister has heart attack, um, you know, uh, flood, whatever it might be. And everyone panics and starts rushing. And it's that they basically try and recreate the wheel each time when you don't need to do it. You need to look backwards, check research, and look around means check if the newsroom has got any uh, journalists there that actually have covered such a story before. And we have one good example of that in these story uh, items here. Uh, so I now want to give you a uh, scenario. Um, I want you all to imagine that you've applied for a job at Reuters news agency and you've gotten through the written test and the first interview and you're now having an interview with the managing editor and you're very excited because you want this job. And um, so you get on the video conference call and they ask you a question that goes something like this. You are sitting in the newsroom in Tokyo and the phone goes and you pick up the phone and on the other end is a person who introduces themselves as Billy Roberts and says, I'm a journalist at Reuters in London and I'm on the street and an explosion has just ripped through the Houses of Parliament and it's on fire. So the question that Reuters will then ask you is, what do you do? What's your first reaction to that? Don't be shy. I got asked this question and I failed, so don't worry about it. Ask where and when. Where and when. Yeah. It's valid. Okay, I'll tell you the answer. This might help you if ever you apply for a job at Reuters. But, um, and just to, to back up a little bit, Reuters is, of course, uh, a news organization that's been around for a long, 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 long time. It's covered wars, disasters, it's reporters for over many uh, decades. It's got an institutional knowledge about these affairs. 
a large number of Reuters journalists have actually been killed while covering wars and conflicts and disasters and so on. So the first thing you're supposed to say to that person when they call that, that into you, the Houses of Parliament are on fire, your first question to them is, are you safe? Are you okay? Is there anything I can do to assist you? Do you need any assistance? You know, can I help you in any way whatsoever? So for an organization that has that institutional knowledge about covering these kind of events, the first question is not, I gotta send a headline right now. You know, how is the parliament on fire? Blah, 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 blah. I've gotta be the first to get this out to the world because it's gonna make my name. I'm gonna break this news. It's not that, it's are you safe? So that's, the lesson there is that, you know, no, none of these stories are worth your life. So the first thing is safety, hence the, um, uh, some of the points I mentioned earlier about practicalities, having the stuff in a car. If you're going into a disaster zone, you have to be prepared. You can't go charging in there uh, gung-ho because you might die. So, um, Safety was the first, uh, is the right answer, if you ever have that Reuters interview. Um, okay, so just to, is there any questions so far? Anything unclear? I might use some kind of uh, newsroom language or acronyms which you don't understand, so please just raise your hand if you don't know what I'm talking about, and I can make it clear. Um, so I said I'm going to jump this uh, Suharto story because we're not going to have time. Quickly go to the Deepwater Horizon, um, which is on the first page. So as I, it gives a, a brief intro here in bold lettering. It was about 64 kilometers off the coast of Louisiana. It exploded April 20, 2010, killed 11 people, and it caused the largest oil spill in U.S. history. Um, one of the things uh, that we found, I found in doing this story, and that's under the, the pointers there in the introduction, is lack of sources and covering places you cannot reach and staggering incompetence. So lack of sources, as I say, I was in Houston to help cover this story. But um, again, if any of you have worked as journalists and tried to cover the oil industry, the oil industry is notoriously difficult to cover as a journalist. Very difficult because, um, you know, oil companies very often are working around the world with despotic re regimes. We have the cases of um, uh, oil disasters and so on. So the oil industry is not very... Uh, best of friends with journalists, you might say. So we lacked really sources for this event, to cover this event. But the second problem was, it was an oil well 64 kilometers offshore. You couldn't get to it to cover it. So we were dependent on basically being drip fed by BP, which was the, uh, the company that leased the well with their press conferences and their press releases each day. But what a company can do through those kind of press releases, like I said earlier, is they can massage the coverage in a way that suits them. And you often have got to go outside of that to other sources to try and get another take on what's really going on. And we had a lot of trouble doing that with this story because we weren't properly prepared with sources. We did have good reporters in Houston, but <clears throat> it was just very difficult getting inside BP. What BP did do is they set up a so-called war room, that is an office in their Houston headquarters where they tried to manage everything that was coming back from uh, the deep water to horizon because remember you had this massive massive oil spill and it was pumping out and they had no way of stopping it um, which is the second point I'll, or last point I'll uh, 
lead to here is staggering incompetence. So whilst we had the difficulty in breaking news on this story and getting sources inside the war room, we did manage to do a story, but you'll see this one, golf balls. Golf balls fall short, coping with 21st century disaster. You'll note the date line on this is 2013. Um, this, uh, Macondo, uh, Deepwater Horizon blew up in 2010. Um, but in chasing the story down over many, many months, and then Fukushima happening, we found a way to link the two uh, accident responses together. And it was this story. So uh, if you read the lead, you know, diaper line of sawdust, golf balls, and shredded tires, there's some of the items used to try and contain the oil and nuclear disasters that marked the end of this century's first decade and the start of the second. And basically, that's how these multi billion dollar companies reacted to this, these disasters. They did not know how to contain them. Um, the, uh, just briefly back on BP, what, what has happened with the oil industry over the last couple of decades is they developed technology to go and drill in ever deeper and deeper and deeper water. So they built out all this technology. They, they know through seismic testing where the oil fields are, but they couldn't reach them. But this technology, they could go deeper and deeper and deeper. So this particular well that blew up was very, very deep. And when it blew up, that's when it became obvious that the technology to drill deeper had not been accompanied with technology to deal with an accident at that kind of depth. And um, this became very clear. Uh, again, we don't have the time to be going through um, all of the stories, but uh, that lead uh, basically sums it up. The second paragraph, the first reaction in plugging radioactive water leaks at Fukushima Atomic Station was sawdust and absorbent polymer, basically diaper liner. That was the first reaction, you know. Um, the BP well, um, they have what they call in the oil industry a junk shot. And what it is, it was first developed, I think in the 1960s, and it was for when a, a well blew up on land. And basically you take all this junk Basically, it's rubber, shredded tires, golf balls, whatever. And you, you get someone, a truck, whatever, to go up there and dump it all inside this, this well that's usually on fire. And it suppresses the fire. And then you put all kinds of mud and what have you on top of it. And finally, concrete. And that's how you seal the well. But they call it a junk shot because it's a pile of junk. And that's what they tried to do at the bottom of the ocean with the BP well. And like this says, guess what? It didn't work. Uh, so this oil disaster eventually cost BP 60 billion US dollars in terms of, uh, they eventually sealed the well by drilling a completely different well down in and intercepted the original one and then poured concrete all the way down that and they eventually managed to seal it. But it looked like it was going to um, carry on forever. And it destroyed hundreds and hundreds of thousands of livelihoods all along the Gulf in terms of fishing, tourism, etc., etc., etc. And um, But I, I guess the then the point of being incompetence, if you're going to cover these, something goes wrong, um, like with the Fukushima case, for example. I remember having a press conference with TEPCO officials uh, uh, when we managed to get them into this club, actually the previous club, and um, asking them questions about the reaction and what they were doing. And I remember very, very clearly the, the feeling coming over me as we were questioning them and they were answering. And I realized it went off like a light bulb. Actually, 
they don't know what they're doing. They really, they're making it up as they go along. And as I say, it's this kind of incompetence you, you come across. Now, this is not an attack on any particular engineers. There are many engineers, of course, both with the BP disaster and with Fukushima, risk their lives day after day after day to try and contain the disaster. But what I'm saying is corporations, the profit motive, if you like, um, they don't invest enough in the insurance policy for uh, dealing with these disasters when they happen. And this story was an attempt to show that, that um, uh, they're basically, these disasters are basically too big for any one company or even any one country to contain. And in fact, if you look at the, uh, the same story in one, two, three, the fourth paragraph is where we have a comment from Andrew DeWitt. He's a professor of political economy here at Rikyo University. Um, a professor of political economy is not necessarily somebody who can comment on this kind of thing, but he had looked into um, disaster responses uh, within the political world and how politicians dealt with them. And he said this, we need an international agency that specializes in stuff like this. You need a world army or navy that could basically become the basis for a task force that can go to the disaster site and deal with it. And um, it actually made a lot of sense at the time of Fukushima, again, if you remember, as that was unfolding and you're watching television and the reactor building blows up, you know, and then it's the next reactor building blows up and you're watching this until it's like, what, what does that mean? You know, it's a great big nuclear reactor building and it's blown up. And so th this made a lot of sense later that, you know, f local forces just get overwhelmed. And so his point that some sort of global task force is needed, I, I doubt it will ever get done. But that was his uh, comment at the time, which um, uh, was, I thought, very telling. You'll also find, and it's in this story, and you'll find it in other stories, that when you're dealing with disasters, people start talking about black swans. You know this term, black swans? You know, it's often re referred to as black swan events. I mean, the reference is the historical one that once upon a time, people believed there was no such thing as a black swan. So it's now, you know, actually there are black swans. <laughs> we all believe this, do we? There are actually black swans. Well, the world at one time didn't believe it, so they didn't exist. Just don't, no, 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 there's no such thing. So a black swan event is often referred to when people are talking about these kind of uh, disasters and they have conferences about black swan events but if you stop and think about it, the fundamentals of a black swan event is it doesn't exist. You know, it, in a sense, it can't be predicted. Um, but nevertheless, in this case, they call a, a conference down in, um, I think it was Australia, where it was, we will discuss black swan events. <laughs> I'm sorry, you've got no idea what you're talking about. But anyway, um, so that was, anyway, a couple of lessons from that one. Um, so if you move on to the next page, uh, it's before Fukushima disaster, or again, if you've got questions at any time, please do just put up your hand, and I can stop. I'd much rather this make sense to you than uh, puzzling you. Uh, so before the Fukushima disaster. So I said to you before, Something happens in a news event, and the, the, the drive is to go to that event and cover it. All the focus goes to that event and finding out what's happened. But I mentioned also about looking backwards. So this is where uh, we managed to, at Bloomberg, we managed to dodge Murphy's Law. Because this story is a piece we did um, 
If you look at the date line again, in 2007, the headline is Japan Nuclear Drive Comprised by Conflicts of Interest. So um, we had a reporter, uh, if, again, for those of you who have looked into the nuclear industry, there's a whole long, long, long history of Japan's nuclear industry and basically one screw up after the other faking safety reports, et cetera, et cetera. So we did this big piece, um, a big investigative piece that was looking at just what's going on in Japan's nuclear industry and its regulatory framework. So the reporter was uh, Jason Clemfield. He said he might try and get here tonight, but he isn't. But um, he went off and he, he spent months on this story and I said to you also earlier the importance of sources. So uh, in the pointer, just here, um, look backwards first for sources, sources and research to help identify uh, people with specialist knowledge. This can save huge amounts of time. So. In this story, we identified two particular individuals. There was a number of others. But Jason was able to get to uh, the core of this problem in Japan's nuclear industry. The first gentleman you'll see in bold is Yoshihiro, uh, Yoshihiro uh, Kinugasa. As it says, he's the leading seismologist on Japan's nuclear licensing panel. Remember, this was before Fukushima. And this man had been signing off on studies for where to build nuclear plants in Japan for decades. The next person uh, bolded in the story, in paragraph three, is Takashi Nakata um, at the Hiroshima Institute of Technology, um, also a seismologist. And he pointed out the same people are making the rules, doing the surveys, and signing off on the inspections. Then you have Katsuhiko Ishibashi. Uh, now, Mr. Ishibashi became absolute lifesaver for us when we were covering Fukushima because he's a seismologist, so uh, he's got all the credentials, but he was highly, highly critical of the policies that were being used to build nuclear power plants in Japan. And he'd written about it. And he'd even written a research paper that predicted a earthquake nuclear power plant disaster. It was a re research paper that was published many years before Fukushima. And it basically spells out Fukushima. So we took these, uh, these individuals, all seismologists, and sort of set them off against each other in terms of uh, the views on the, um, uh, the industry, how uh, rules were being set, and so forth. Again, you may not be aware, but Japan at the time had what was called the so-called 10-kilometer rule. And this was a rule that uh, was based on a, a seismic, um, a fault line that was identified. And if the length was less than 10 kilometers, then you could build a nuclear power plant in that area. I'm simplifying this m massively, but basically the 10 kilometer rule was gazed around the idea that that type length of fault would produce an earthquake of X magnitude so if you built a power plant to withstand that magnitude, it was okay. So Japan's plants were built along uh, construction lines to meet that level of quake, which if my memory serves me was 6.2, but I could be wrong on that. So what these uh, seismologists uh, said Mr. Kinogasa had been doing is basically fudging the data because he was a part of the um, nuclear licensing panel. And at this time, again, before Fukushima, Japan's regulator and Japan's nuclear power industry were both in and under the umbrella of the Ministry of Economy and Trade. So you had 
the the industry promoting nuclear and the industry supposedly regulating nuclear basically in each other's pockets as it were whereas in the united states and in france the regulators are separate off from the the industry there has to be independence from it so anyway this story was all about how basically japan had been uh, fudging this data again i we don't have the time to go through all of this but you've got the story if you want to uh, read it um, if you go to the second page at the bottom here that begins we have built objectivity, fairness, and neutrality into examining nuclear plant safety, says Akira Fukushima, which is an unfortunate name, considering for what happened later. But he was a deputy, deputy director general for safety examination at NISA, which was the regulator at the time. So he's saying everything's OK. You know, it's, we're objective, we're fair. Separating our agency from the trade ministry isn't the issue. Then if you go to the next paragraph, you have one of the, the head of uh, the French regulator saying, if you want to be a legitimate, credible, authoritative regulator, then you have to be independent. So again, we were able to set these conflicts off against each other. And it's all about the sources we were able to reach, the authoritative sources uh, in these particular fields. So. The story goes on, uh, again, showing these um, this dispute. But that story, as I say, was enormously valuable to us when, when Fukushima happened, because we had a whole raft of sources, uh, a whole raft of explanations of what had been happening in the institute. We could then use as the reference. So it's looked back. And Jason Clemfield, the reporter who did the story, was in the newsroom. So I could say to Jason, Jason, can you get uh, Professor Shibashi back on the phone because we need him to talk about this. So right away, you've got that source who is an authoritative, authoritative commentator on uh, earthquakes because he wrote the research paper and the books and that's what he is. He's a professor of seismology. So that is something that needs to be built beforehand. Um, the next story... Excuse me for speeding on. So I've only got a few minutes left, <laughs> 10 minutes. Um, very, very quickly, um, nuclear warriors. It's the next story. Find respite on ship to fight to avert meltdown. Like I said about the Macondo, uh, the Deepwater Horizon, the problem with Deepwater Horizon was it was an oil rig out in the middle of the Gulf. You can't get to it. Fukushima threw up the same problem. It's a nuclear radiation zone. You can't get in. So how do you talk to the people who are dealing with it? Because this is a case of a story where you don't really want to be talking to the head of TEPCO because he's in Tokyo. You don't really want to be... I mean, yeah, you'll talk to him, but how do you really know what's going on inside that plant? What is actually happening? Well, you need to be able to talk to the engineers. And this story is based around the first opportunity we had because this, at this time they weren't allowing the media into the exclusion zone. Like I said, we did go in, but you, it's, you couldn't get to the plant. So this is, uh, they decided to give, um, well, it's, it's the 24th of, of March. So it's, what, 10, 11 days after the accident or so. And um, they brought out a lot of engineers Okay. Um, from the the reactor from Fukushima to a ship that was berthed in this uh, port uh, nearby, and it was in order to give them a hot meal, uh, s some proper rest. Because remember, these engineers have basically been well for much of the time they've been working in blackness. There was no light. They had all their measuring instruments were gone they were best guessing what was happening with dosimeters and what have you, with radiation spiking everywhere. They And we had, in another story, we, ha we have engineers who said to us later, in those days, you know, after the, 
the disaster took place, the meltdowns happened, we were blind. We had no way of knowing what was going on. You know, it was just, and slowly they managed to get lighting up and other things and assistance came to them. But this was the chance to talk to them directly. So we went up there and uh, parked ourselves on the dock. And as they came uh, in, they were bussed in from, I think the, the port was, uh, they were bussed on a hammer port. It was 50 kilometers south of Daiichi, uh, the Daiichi plant. So they were bussed down, had the night, then we were waiting on the gangplank to interview them when they came off to get in the bus and go back to the, the plant. So this was a, one of those occasions again where you've got to find the way to talk to the people who are really at the front line of handling the disaster. So this was a story that developed out of that um, because it was particularly difficult to get to them. So moving quickly on, uh, but that, that's filled with interviews with those engineers, uh, if you want to read that story. The next one is the TikTok, Japan's terrifying day. Do, does, every, does anyone not know what a TikTok is? Okay, a TikTok is a, uh, basically just a journalistic term for when you're launching on, you've got a big story to deal with, and basically you want to try and recreate it chronologically, how it actually happened. And the way you do that is, again, you, the sources you have are absolutely essential because you need to have people who were there, you know, who experienced it, who went through it, eyewitnesses and, and so on, survivors who can tell you the story. So again, TikToks uh, can be very difficult to do because again, with disasters, how do you get to the people? So, uh, but that's basically what it is. You'll, you'll hear it used in media sometimes. Um, so it says in the pointer, you're trying to reconstruct the events through multiple eyewitness reports and then knit it all together into a narrative that tells the tale of what happened. So I can ask you a question. The lead person in this story, and this is a long piece, this is one of the best stories we did and we, we won one of the SOPA awards uh, for this piece. But the lead person is Makoto Nagai. You know, why would you put him right at the top of your story? Well, we had quite some difficulty getting hold of this gentleman, but one of our reporters who was calling around different areas in the earthquake zone, this of course is Sendai, and managed to find him. And the reason why we put him here is because um, he was the head of the emergency response team in Sendai. That's his job. That's what he that's what he does. And Sendai, of course, bore a lot of the brunt of the quake itself. So he explained exactly what happened. At that moment, it was 2.46 p.m. on March 11, when he had this like little, he had some sort of contraption on his desk, which was an earthquake buzzer. And as it explains here, it's got an orange LCD screen on it, and it flashed 100 and then four and in two separate you know, monitors, 100 and separately four. And that told them that in 100 seconds, a magnitude four quake was going to hit the city of Sendai. And then the, the, the dial on the thing just went crazy. And then he said, you know, he stood up and he explained, uh, I always thought it very descriptive. It wasn't like, you know, everything sort of collapsed in on me, you know, it all fell apart. He just stood up and his, his clear memory was his coffee cup was sitting on his table and it just bounced like that right across his table and then fell off. And then all the walls started falling down and then everyone started screaming and then that was how it began. So you're starting your story with your 
your TikTok with a person right at the center of it and what actually happened. I said earlier to you about you may have problems with your so-called leadership of getting these stories done. I had enormous problems with uh, New York in getting this lead cleared because, again, the way they were talking to me is, how can you talk about a coffee cup bouncing across a table when you've got one of the world's biggest earthquakes happening? You know, they wanted, they wanted the, you know, the building collapsing. But the man who was actually there in the moment on the scene, irresponsible, that's what happened. So we tried to be true to that and uh, eventually got it through. Um, in the one, two, three, four, paragraph five, that's uh, again bolded under the ocean floor that day. This is again a news c known as a so called nut graph. Um, this is where you're trying to encapsulate. Um, excuse me, I'm just going to set a timer so I don't run over. You're trying to encapsulate what has happened. And this, the sheer scale of it, and this was that attempt, you know, the under the ocean floor that day, that became known as uh, San Tenichichi in Japan, or 311, two 50 mile thick slabs of the Earth's crust heaved in an 80 million year old conflict between tectonic plates. And then we had a, a professor who gave us this estimate on energy released by that. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. Uh, you know, 24,000 times stronger than the atom bomb dropped on Nagasaki. Does that really translate? I'm not so sure it does, but we're just trying to get, what sort of power are you talking about here? What is the energy you release? And the last part, that Fukushima earthquake actually wrenched Japan's total coastline 3.6 meters closer to the United States. You know, it took the entire Japan and shifted it. So in that nut graph, you're trying to sort of show the scale of what you're dealing with here. But very quickly, we then tried to set this up with, you know, what we're going to tell you now, talks with engineers, contract workers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, we'll tell you. We went then from Sendai right into the nuclear power plant. And we got this gentleman who's in this part here. This section on the relieved workers, um, Mr. Yokota. Where is he introduced? Oh, sorry, he's introduced higher up. Um, Kazuma Yokota, Nisa. He was in the Fukushima plant, Daiichi plant. And he described what happened, uh, you know, climbing under his desk, and then these walls being, uh, cabinets being ripped off the walls and so on. Um, but one key thing I want to explain here about the quake is the, the Daiichi nuclear power plant, when it got hit by this quake, which is the biggest on record in Japan, um, it actually survived. It came through it. And uh, as we describe here, he, he told us later, Yokota, what happened when he got out of his office. Um, he walked up the hill uh, behind the plant with thousands and thousands of the employees who were in the plant that day. In fact, there were 6,415 people at the Fukushima plant that day. Uh, it's massive, right? 5,500 of them were subcontractors. Now, when the quake happened and all the, the shutdowns happened and everyone got out and they have earthquake evacuation zones to go to, there was thousands and thousands of men. He told us this scene of, you know, all in orange and blue and white boiler suits crunching over glass going to the top. And they all went to their evacuation points and they were all counted. And when they counted them all, they had 6,413 people accounted for. 
there was only two people missing in the entire Fukushima plant. So the view of the engineers and many others uh, at that time, because now they wanted to get out of the plant because they, you know, get home to see their families, what kind of damage has the earthquake done? They believed everything was okay. The plant has withstood the quake. It's all right, we're safe. And there's only there's two people missing somewhere, but there's thousands and thousands of people. It's all fine. We're out, we're safe. Let's go now check on our families, which is what they did. Now we talked to lots and lots of um, engineers who stayed behind in Fukushima. And interestingly, many of them said they had no idea this tsunami hit. You know, they were in buildings trying to deal with, you know, what the quake damage had done. But basically, you know, I think there was three react two or three reactors running at the time. I don't remember exactly. But they went into automatic shutdown. The others were already offline. Yeah, three were running, went into automatic shutdown. Everything was working. They survived the quake. It was fine. All the people up the hill, you, you had difficulty seeing down into the plant itself from where they were, they said. And there's very, very, very few eyewitnesses for the tsunami that hit the Daiichi plant. Very, very few. But what happened is that the, the tsunami came in and um, it is true, well, there's still a dispute about this, is was Daiichi fundamentally undermined by the quake or was it just a tsunami that did it? The TEPCOs and such like will say it survived the quake. There's other questions now about damage that was done. But it was the tsunami that came in, of course, and TEPCO, in its wisdom, had put all of its backup generators, as you're probably all aware, in the basements. The tsunami came in and just knocked out all the generators. And at the same time, the earthquake had destroyed a substation about 10 kilometers away. So effectively, it cut off all, all electricity to, uh, to Daiichi. So that's when they lost the ability to... Um, Manage the response. They lost all power to it. But it's, it's very interesting that we think of the tsunami. Very, very, very few people actually saw it at Daiichi, even though it's what is said to have um, done it in. So again, we talked to these other people afterwards. Even a day or two afterwards, they were still thinking, it's fine, it's okay, everything's standing up. And it was only slowly it unfolded just how how bad it uh, became. Um, so I'll just bring in a gentleman here who's going to come in later on. I managed to get a picture. I had this picture when I was covering Fukushima. As I say, it went on for about two years. I had this picture pinned to my desk right in front of me so I could see it every day when I sat down. And uh, this is Masao Yoshida. <clears throat> was the plant manager of uh, Fukushima and is the one who stayed behind and um, we're gonna we've got a story later on which I'll try and get to which is about the Fukushima 50 have you heard of the Fukushima 50 yeah anybody so he was the plant manager and he basically was the one who uh, told so many people to leave, like the, the first waves of people left the plant, but then there was lots of engineers still there. He ordered more and more people to leave because they really didn't know what was gonna happen. Like I said, they were working blind. And by this time you had hydrogen explosions blowing out the buildings. They were losing control. They thought of the plant, he sent more people home. And finally, uh, he got it down to a central core 
of engineers who stayed uh, to deal with the disaster. So um, we managed to talk to a couple of people who knew him. We couldn't get him in the plant. Um, we did find a, a YouTube video of him uh, doing a New Year greeting at Daiichi, the you know the New Year just before March. Uh, explaining, he's a very experienced man. He knew the site itself well. He'd worked there before, um, but he was the one who led things um, after that. Um, so again, I'm going to have to cut short this story. But this is a big piece. This TikTok it ranges all the way up and down the coastline, into the plant, out of the plant, talking with all of the different people uh, that were involved over the initial uh, few days. And um, if you turn to the very last page of it, it's just above this one, which is 311 Rescuers in Japan's triple disaster. You'll find the last line of the story. Um, we have one of the engineers talking about his wife. You know, when he was in the middle of trying to deal with the disaster, and he thought he was going to die. He was thinking of his wife, um, which was very nice. Um, but the next day, the last line, the next day in the adjoining turbine building, the bodies of, the, remember, the two missing workers? They found the two missing workers in... Um, in the turbine building basement, and they'd actually been caught by the tsunami and and drowned. So they were the two missing uh, people. But again, to think about that, thousands and thousands and thousands of people, all of them got out. Um, it's quite phenomenal, really. Um, okay, so the next one is 311 Rescuers. I'm going to jump over this, but basically what it is, is we decided that we needed another story that really talked to the people who came in as the so-called first responders. So if you remember, if you were here, helicopters were flying above the plant, dumping water on it and so on. Fire trucks were coming in with their hoses. We wanted to talk to the firemen and the, and the helicopter pilots and what was that like? So we got the helicopter pilot He's in the first uh, lead of this story, uh, Tsutomu Kimura. And he talked about, you know, flying over the smoke and ruins of the number three reactor building when his helicopter went over and dropped all that water. And what did he, what was he thinking? You know, what was it? And he tells, you know, his worries. What if it blows up again while I'm here? My family, what will happen? So... Again, this story goes and primarily looks at a lot of the self-defense force staff as well who flooded into the area. The Japan's self-defense force and also the U.S. Uh, forces set up what became known as Operation Tomidachi, Tomidachi, which was to rescue as many people as they could. And they all flooded in. Excuse the term. They all came into the region. And they saved thousands of people's lives, got lots of people to, to safety as well as bringing supplies. And um, the last part of this story, in a news article, you're often looking for what we call the kicker, which is right at the end of the story. You don't want to let a story just kind of drizzle out and fizzle out into nothing. You want some kind of kick at the end of it to make someone remember. Well, we found out that one of the U.S. Uh, airmen who was flying in, Major Brian Helton, uh, was also the one who flew the first U.S. military aircraft into Port-au-Prince after the Haiti uh, earthquake, magnitude 7 quake, in January 2010. And for that, he got a nickname, Hero of Haiti. And now they nicknamed him the son of Sendai, which is a nice uh, way of showing the uh, 
uh, appreciation of the people and what they did. Uh, the next piece is perhaps the one that I think is the best that we did during this period. TEPCO's deal with devil signals end to Japan's post-war era. Um, uh, okay, so this story uh, all came about because a reporter said to me one day, the guy who was in charge of um, TEPCO, when they decided to build the nuclear power plants in Fukushima, was actually from Fukushima. And he said to me, the reporter said, and guess what, there's a statue to him somewhere in Fukushima. So I thought, that is an amazing story. We have to tell that story. So this set us off on the search for who is this, who is this person. Um, it turns out, I mean, often you get tips like that from reporters that are wrong. It turns out this was true. And it was uh, uh, Kazutaka Kikawada. And he was brought up in this Yamafunyu. Um, that was the, sorry, that's the school he went to. And that's the elementary school. And we went there and um, we actually found somebody who actually knew him. And uh, in this, if you turn the page, sorry, there's no numbers on these, but from here at the bottom, turn the page. The first bolded section, Chozu Yamaki. He was actually there in the village when we, our reporters went there. They, you know, they asked around, did anybody ever know Kikawada? And they were told, oh, try this guy down the street. And they met him, he, they, he knew him. And he started to give us details about uh, Kikawada, the type of person he was and so on. And, um, and further on down, we got other people to talk about him, who knew him, who worked with him. But he was in charge of TEPCO when they made the decision to build Daiichi. And he referred to it, interestingly enough, as a deal with the devil. He was the head of TEPCO, but he regarded nuclear power as making a deal with the devil. Um, the reason being, as he explained later, it's in the story, if you get if you wish to read it through, this was um, not that long after the end of the Second World War. Kikawada is one of his main um, influences was a, a liberal writer who'd been imprisoned during the war because of his views. And um, Kikawada he seems to have been quite a complex character. That he, he, he seemed to have been tempered with a lot of social views and social values, but was a, the head of um, TEPCO. And Japan was going through this enormous growth period at the time, and it needed energy. And he faced that dilemma um, of using nuclear. But he made a comment to one of the, his associates that we uh, spoke to, and he referred back to the war and the government. And he said Japan's government had just taken the country through a catastrophic war that had killed millions of people. And he didn't want nuclear power only in the hands of the government. He said there needs to be private industry, private control over nuclear power. So what had happened in the war influenced him in that respect. The other issue that is often forgotten about is Japan in the 1950s and 60s was an environmental nightmare, right? The, 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 uh, we had the Minamata uh, disaster, Minamata disease, the poisonings, the, the growth, uh, the chemical dumpings in Minamata Bay. The growth was so phenomenal, but Japan was, uh, um, you know, just an awful place to 
smoke, smog, etc., etc. So again, this influenced him in bringing nuclear, which was seen as a cleaner energy. But he, he did actually um, refer to it as such. So we started it off with somebody that knew him in his town, in his village. This same individual actually uh, built the tombstone for Kikawada's mother, um, a grave. So we had that in detail. But then we tried to take this story right through. How did nuclear, how did a country that had been bombed by nuclear weapons come to embrace nuclear power? How could that happen? So this story attempts to tell that tale through the, um, the um, you know, Japan's economic uh, development. So I would, uh, if you have a chance to read, as I say, it was a, it's, a, it's not black and white, you know. It's easy, we, you get very, very angry with TEPCO, but when you look into these origins of why Mr. Kikawada made this decision, it was, it's, it's not black and white. Um, whatever you think about nuclear power, um, so anyway, this story is a long piece, um, and it comes back to uh, finishing at uh, Mr. Kikawada's uh, childhood home, where his the little elementary school where he used to do track and field was covered with all these blue tarpaulins. There was graffiti all over the walls. TEPCO, get your poisonous radiation out of here. And so it, it came back and finished again with a kicker from um, the man that knew him, who still lived there in the village. Um, the next one, Fukushima toxic waste wells. I'm not going to have time to go through this, but this was a light bulb moment for me again. This is when we got Jason Clemfield, same reporter. This is when in 2013, TEPCO had started to allow the news to go into Daiichi. Um, it happened before this, but he went up there and he, he got in. And he called me up that evening. And he, to go into the site, you had to wear all these coveralls and masks and everything, dosimeters and everything else. And you were bust in. And he said, you know, when you go through high radiation zones, the bus like speeds through and then slows down in areas where it's not so bad. But at the end, you come back to the area where everyone was staying, um, and uh, you basically have to take off all this stuff you, you've been wearing, the boots, the boiler suits, the hat, the, all the masks, everything, and you dump it in this, you know, this huge um, you know, dumping area. And everyone has to do this. And he said to me, you know what? Every day there's thousands of people, hundreds, thousands of people going into the plant with all this stuff. And every day they come out and then they have to throw all this stuff into the dump because it's touched radiation. And it can't be, you know, they've got to put it somewhere to isolate it. And then anything that touches that has then possibly radiated so anything that then touches that is and he, he suddenly painted this picture of me uh, to me of it was almost as if it was like a a communicable virus you know everything that had touched anything that had been inside the plant and you see you take it off you have to dump it and that's why of course to, to do with the the water problem that fukushima has right now and they don't have a solution for it all the water that's been poured through there that is radiating. So you get different levels, depending on who you talk to, it's safe to dump in the ocean, uh, but ask fishermen, and they certainly don't want that to happen. So that's, I've, yeah, it just gave that, wow, yeah, whatever it touches, it's like, it then it, you, you've got to burn it, you've got to dump it, you've got to somehow isolate it. So this is, um, yeah, it struck me. So, um, Finally, because again, we are only got 10 minutes left. The last piece, Japan pays tribute to man who led Fukushima 50 in disaster. Uh, this was um, uh, Mr. Uh, Yoshida, Masao Yoshida. 
Um, so the lead here, uh, psh, I don't know if you think about what he had to face up to, confronted a horror few can conceive, and he stood his ground. Another point to remember here is that at one point, again, now TEPCO disputes this, um, but the Prime Minister at the time, Naoto Kan, says he was told by TEPCO that they were going to evacuate the plant totally. That's what he said. Then he got into a big shouting match with TEPCO because we now know those reactors are melting down and you want to walk away? So he's given a number of press conferences since which I've attended and asked him the question, well, if you stay, then it could mean you're going to die. And he said, yes, but that was the consequence. Now, as I say, TEPCO will dispute this, but it seems fairly, um, fairly clear they did tell Masao Yoshida to evacuate the plant and take everyone with him, get out, because the reactors are melting down. And Masao Yoshida refused. He disobeyed orders. So um, TEPCO, in its wisdom, then decided it was going to reprimand Yoshida for this disobedience until Mr. Khan stepped in and basically told them, you know, don't you dare, because uh, uh, Yoshida stayed at his post with his engineers, the Fukushima 50. Um, and he was there for, I think, nine months uh, straight through. Um, but then he finally, why did he come out? Um, uh, he was diagnosed with cancer. It wasn't reportedly linked to his time in the the plant, as you know, cancers can take a long time to develop. There's no way of attributing, if you get cancer, there's no way of attributing it to a particular radiation exposure. You can't link it that way. So, but he was diagnosed with cancer. Um, but you think about it, after what he'd been through and everything else, then that's what happens. Um, so he came out of the plant, we found out where he lived, it was down in Yokohama, and we staked out his apartment with a couple of reporters, but we kept missing him. You know, our reporter went and knocked on the door a few times, spoke to his wife, but said, oh, he's just stepped out, he's not here. But we could never get hold of him. Um, I never got the chance to interview him directly, but then I know, and then he he died, and um, what this uh, is the memorial ceremony uh, for him. Um, which you know, Mr. Khan spoke there, and you have this. Um, there is this author in the last part of the story, Lucio. Kadota, who interviewed him, and other members of the 50, the man who stared down death, and he gives, you know, an interview. We spoke to him. He gave the interview to us and said, if Yoshida hadn't been a plant manager, Tokyo would be a no man's land right now. So, um, you can't actually know if that's actually true, but nobody knows what would have happened if Mr. Yoshida had decided to walk away and take all of his engineers with him and just leave it. Because you're seeing the problems they're having now in trying to control it. So if anyone was the hero in all of this, of course, it's him and uh, what he did. Um, I always find it very ironic when talking about him that if you look at... Uh, is it in here? 
page before. Mm. Uh, I don't think it's here, sorry. It was in other stories, but the Fukushima 50, were, oh, here it is. In the middle of the story at the top, Spain gave the Fukushima 50 the Prince of Asturias Award for Concord in September 2011, calling them the heroes of Fukushima. I mean, that's Spain. The thing that's often really troubled me is, what did Japan do? <laughs> in terms of the, you know, the award, or, or to honor this man and what he did. Um, you know, it, it's not, it's not um, portrayed in the way it should be. He doesn't get the honors he should have got. He doesn't get the, the accolades he should have got because he throws into light the problem with nuclear power. You know, even though he was a, a nuclear engineer. But he was the one who faced down a disaster. And if, if, you, if you elevate him, you know, and in that way, you're elevating, you know, in a sense, the disaster itself and what happened. And the nuclear power industry doesn't want that. Neither does Japan's government, obviously. Otherwise, they would have given him the credit he deserved. Anyway, we're almost out of time. So I've jumped over all kinds of stuff, but, you know, just too much. This uh, other thing I mentioned here, the other sheet of paper, which is Fukushima coverage and a TikTok. Uh, all this is, uh, is basically, as I said to you earlier, when these disasters happen, the, the tendency is to run at it. And, you know, we've got no time to talk now. We've got no time to have a news meeting. We've got to send headlines. We've got to send headlines. We've got to do this story. We've got to get to Fukushima. But that is just a time when you've got to step back and in every newsroom, the, the normal practice is to have a news meeting. You know, what's the agenda today? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Tell me. Oh, you're doing something that he can help you with, so you talk to each other, and you want to manage the coverage every day. And the tendency with disasters is to let that slide because you're so monstered by everything that has to be done. But... Um, when disasters happen, it's all the more reason to have that morning news meeting to really get control of the coverage and what you're trying to do and properly assigning the people to the coverage. Otherwise, the, cover otherwise the disaster will run you. It will just, it'll just overwhelm you. So that, anyway, this is an example of uh, and all the people, we had different people called in, reporters, editors. Um, actually, out of this, just to mention, I mentioned Jason Clemfield, who did the, the couple of real big pieces. The other guy did the major story on the, um, the deal with the devil is a guy here called Stuart Biggs. He's now working in London for, uh, he's still at Bloomberg. I uh, just a, Absolutely excellent uh, reporter. Uh, just amazing uh, work he did. Uh, I mean, many of these people did the same. But uh, anyway, we just laid out the news meeting. Okay, what are we doing today? What's going, what are we doing? You've got to really be uh, in your face, you know, about what's happening. Uh, give examples. This was about the TikTok. You know, what are we trying to do with this TikTok what is it? What are we trying to do with it? So you've got to explain it out to everyone, the ABCs, so that by the time you give out reporting assignments, which are here, each reporter knows specifically what they're supposed to be doing, what, who they're supposed to be calling, what their you know, piece of responsibility is. So, um, you know, I just put that in there because I, I, f I found it by accident, actually, on an email from that time when we were covering it. There's all kinds of things. Like, if you look on this page, Finbar, who was a, a reporter we had here, 
Lawson lost 68 shops in the disaster and more than 100 staff are unaccounted for. Um, so what about all the other convenience stores they're all up and down that coast what's going on you know how many stores have they lost how many staff have they lost that's another angle into the story so he was given a responsibility calling 7-eleven lawson and every other um store um, and of course when we went up there we found many of the stores were completely wrecked um so has anyone got any questions? I was looking for something else, but I... We're almost at the end of time, but... Um, There's one other, oh yeah, I think it was. Oh, sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, may I? Thank yeah. you. Sorry, uh, sorry, I was looking at this. but. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much for a great talk. Um, um, I uh, wanted to ask you about this question of attitude, which oh, um, yeah. you left, uh, I mean, and especially for this kind of really, um, you have limited time to produce stories, and you see a number of reporters working on the same assignment, and I'm sure that some reporters do a better job uh, somehow to get sources in a limited time. And would you mind sharing us some of the great reporters did to, to produce results? Uh, sure. Well, like I said at the beginning, there isn't, I'm afraid there isn't a silver bullet to it. It is just basic, you know, real fundamental journalism of, of um, building the sources. And um, that's what we had to do. But in the case, like I mentioned, of the, the, the fact that we'd done that story that outlined the nuclear power industry in Japan, it gave us a real head start, as it were. And we had lots of sources, and Jason had lots of sources. So it gave us somebody to to uh, work with but then other than that it was going to the area and you know the one-on-one -on -one interviews uh, with the engineers when we could get them people who'd survived you know the destruction and so on talking to um, people in the uh, the um, the evacuees you know in the different um, schools and uh you know they were often put in the gymnasiums where people were living and talking to those and finding out what what happened and um i mean that was very difficult that part of it because you know you talk to people who just had their lives ripped apart and lost you know loved ones um, so that's very difficult to do, to talk to those people. And, oh, and yeah, it's going slightly off from your, your question, but you know when you go, as a journalist, you go into a, an area and the, the sort of fundamentals of the business is you need to be objective to keep your distance. You're there to report. You take the information, you write it up, and you, you try and get a balanced view of what is going on and then you present that in a story which is then to go to the public to inform the public in the best way possible about what is happening in this area but when you go in and you you meet people who are particularly the you know survivors and the evacuees living in um in those conditions you feel like you want to give them everything you know we gave like the, the gasoline we were supposed to keep in the car, you know, we gave it to, to one family. We gave all the money we had to one of the families. And it wasn't, they didn't ask. You know, it's just like, it was just spontaneous. And it, you forget all about the objectivity and, and so on with what these people are going through. This, you know, and um, 
you know, that was the, the most difficult part of it for me. Um, those those people, because we kept going back to them as well. You know, to has this their story of recovery, but yeah, it, there are definitely you know I I think it's true in journalism that there are there are people who are very good reporters, there are people who are better at writing, people who are better at editing. I think if you if you start working in journalism, you begin to recognize your strengths, and there are some people who are just really really good reporters. They can't write very well sometimes, but they'll get you the information you need, and then a better writer or editor can, you know, shape it and put it together. So we definitely did have to focus on. I mean, I I knew the people in the room who uh, were de really the 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 reporters, and I knew the people I believed I could uh, depend on to go into the region. And not do something silly, you know, to be safe and and so on. Um, but we did have cases of um, when one reporting team went up there. This was in between or before the first reactor building blew, and it blew up on the way. I think they got to Utsunomiya, then they got a car, and then they got some. They got managed to get gasoline, and then the news came through because I insisted that they stay in touch with me uh, every hour. We were calling; everything's okay. And then it, that building blew, and then one of the reporters panicked, and it's fair. It's very understandable because you know, again, if, when you're in the middle of it, you know, you actually don't know what's going to happen. You know, a great big nuclear power plant blew up, and I'm going straight to it. You know, so one reporter really got um, very, um, how do I say, upset, panicked, and so we had to stop everything and get that reporter back, and then send another reporter to join the other person because we couldn't well the rules we had then was you couldn't go in there alone that was the rules of Bloomberg others just other people just went right but Bloomberg you had to have somebody else with you just in case of you know accidents or whatever so yeah that yeah that's how it kind of panned out but it's knowing your reporters and who's best for or what is that? Is that in any way answer the question or more? Yes. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah. Uh, so Naoto Khan uh, came to the club in December 2013, and he has already uh, he has written a book on his uh, experiences yeah. at this time, and he said that by a pure miracle, uh, Tokyo and the whole of Japan, the center of Japan, was saved because. Yeah the uh, uh, spent fuel pool did not dry out and, uh, and then a huge nuclear cloud would have developed not an explosion but uh, it heated then to uh, uh, very hot temperatures and uh, so this miracle was it um, further investigated by investigative uh, press yeah uh, he said this and as a fact it's tremendous because uh, uh, it could have uh, uh, made Japan an uninhabitable in country. Uh, so, but it is very quiet now about this topic. Yeah. So, did nobody investigate on that, or was TEPCO in the way uh, to let facts out uh, and uh, uh, to verify this about the um, the spent fuel pool? Yeah. I mean, yeah. The, uh, reactor number four. Yeah, well, I'm trying, in that TikTok story, we actually spoke to a couple of um, nuclear engineers in the United States, and we had a couple of them say to us, the, the, and they, these are nuclear engineers, they built nuclear power plants, and they said to us, the freakiest time was 
when that uh, the spent fuel pool dried out. I'm trying to find the, their comments here. Um, yeah, it's um, <clears throat> there's a subhead here on the terrifying event and reactor 4 as you say was shut down for maintenance but there was 1300 fuel rods on the top of the reactor in the, the spent fuel pool and it was um, losing water so he said uh, this uh, nuclear engineer so I've got the second reference, I haven't got his full name, but you'll see it in the story. He said, before the spent fuel pool ignited, I could put my thumbs under my suspenders and say, yeah, that's a small break loca. Small break loca means loss of cooling accident. So a small break loca means, you know, we know about this stuff. Nuclear engineers have what they call a playbook. So when an accident happens, they've got all kinds of scenarios that are in the playbook for how to deal with it. So he was saying that's, you know, that's in the playbook. It's, um, but then he said, but that what turned out to be the most terrifying event, you know, because there was no containment structure whatsoever. They don't have a roof. And that could have been a game, game changer. So by that time, now there was three reactors melting down and a fourth with a fire blowing radiation into the air. So how they got that fire under control, I think, can, I was at the same press conference you mentioned, I think, and it's, it's never been <laughs> clearly actually defined. I mean, he refers to it as a you know, miracle, act of God, whatever, whatever. But that would have been, you know, the real game changer because that's what all the nuclear people in the States who are looking at it, and many of them, of course, were advising TEPCO. Um, that was, yeah, that's where that line comes from, most terrifying day. So I, I, I don't know, you know, wh how that got put out. If that was, is that's the point of your question, right? How, yeah. Because, uh, uh, this kind of dimension, a disaster of this magnitude, yeah. uh, would have been the end of Japan, yeah. You yeah. can't evacuate uh, 40 million people. Yeah. And uh, to just escape this kind of a disaster because a, a gate, floodgate, uh, opened where yeah. it should not have opened in, yeah. under normal circumstances. Because of this kind of miracle, water poured into the uh, spent fuel pool and kept the yeah. uh, fuel rods uh, uh, under water. Yeah. Uh, this is the uh, effect that should have uh, big headlines and all the time. But it's so quiet about this. Yeah. Well, I so think I wonder mm. why uh, the press <coughs> is also very quiet about this. Well, I know when we tried to deal with that, we were... You, you got to imagine the scene at the time was so absolutely chaotic, right? There was helicopters coming over, dumping water. There was, there was all kinds of fire crews brought in, and they were pouring water in from every which way they could. There was pumps and so on. Yoshida got into trouble with TEPCO as well because he started pumping seawater in to cool it. And if you pump seawater in, you're basically writing off the reactor, right? You can't recover it from seawater. It's got to be fresh water. So um, I think it was through that, you know, th those various means of all the water they were throwing at it, they managed to keep it under control. But uh, again, in this story, the, um, the TikTok, we did get a comment from a nuclear physicist in uh, Obninsk, which is the site of Russia's first nuclear power plant. We, we also got lucky in our coverage. I mentioned Murphy's Law. We got lucky because we had a guy in the... There's a, a reporter here in the newsroom in Tokyo. Um, uh, name of uh, Yuri Humber. And Yuri was actually born in Russia and brought up in Russia and then went to the UK 
lived there, educated there, then came to Japan. So he spoke Russian. And in between moving to Japan, he went back to Russia and worked as a journalist and actually had covered the energy industry. So he had all kinds of contacts. And of course, with Fukushima, everyone was going Chernobyl, Chernobyl, you know, the comparison. So he would call his contacts. And we got uh, a couple in this story. And one of them did talk about that. I've lost my page now. Saying that, agreeing that that was also the worst moment. But he said something about the... He said wind could have picked up a lot of the uh, uh, radionuclides, but he said a number of them were, were heavy nuclides, and he didn't think they could get blown as far as Tokyo. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why they set the exclusion zone at 20 kilometers. Because this, this uh, guy, oh, here it is. Uh, Gennady Pashakin, who's a nuclear physicist at this site in Russia, said, to your point, the fresher the, f the fuel, and this fuel in four in the pool was fresh, um, the higher the radiation volume, especially of iodine and cesium. The radio gases also contain heavy elements, so while winds could blow them some 20 kilometers, they wouldn't reach Tokyo. So that was his view of it. Other people didn't see it quite that way. But um, the song, the other thing that this showed to me about nuclear is there's so many people just don't, it's so much of it's a mystery. You know, how much is needed? To, you know, what can you, what can you survive? What, what's a safe dose? There is background radiation anywhere, everywhere, but you know, what's, the more you, when this happened, the more you read and read, the, the little you see is really understood about, about it. But yeah, I do remember that from Mr. Khan. Mm. I think he called it a miracle. Any other questions? We are just about out at war. We're way over, actually, 20 minutes. But, uh, there was one other thing, but I can't remember what it was. I may have just another question. Yeah, sure. Uh, that uh, the uh, Washington Post, uh, Simon Denier, or how do you pronounce it? D E N Y E R. D E N Denier. Denier. Yeah. yeah. He said that the uh, uh, <coughs> decommissioning will take uh, your sources, uh, 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 will take 200 years. And uh, then he refers to the Japan Center for Economic Research, a conservative think tank, which said that the cost of the cleanup bill will be around 640 billion US dollars. Yeah. And <laughs> so it keeps going up every year. Yeah, I remember when it was 160 yeah. billion, but yeah, it's, oh, yeah. it's, it's astronomical. It's, no one knows really. Mm. Yeah. But the, the, just one final point then, just uh, about this, um, just came back to me. In these disaster zones, I've found as well, things get really weird. Really weird sort of stuff happens because we were driving from uh, Iwaki and north of Iwaki and everything was shut down. You know, there was power was off in most places. But I remember us getting to um, a town, we, we were heading, trying to get through to Fukushima itself to talk to TEPCO engineers and what have you. And we actually came to a, a place where there was a 7-Eleven open. And it was like, wow, you know, because it stood out, because everywhere was black. And when we came around and there was a 7-Eleven when the lights were on and people were there and so on. So the thing I remember so clear about this, though, was going in because we, we needed water. And most of it was, there wasn't much in there, it was bare. But they had like huge, at the entrance when you went in, you had these huge shelves, you know, about the length of those two tables, just shelves all the way down. And they were filled with, you know, the, the envelopes that you use for funerals in Japan? Mm -hmm. The, you know, the black, uh, 
when you go to the funeral. It was just like completely filled with it was like and um, then I got some water and came out and I was standing by the car drinking some of this water and then this um, there was a car parked on this side it was like a, a little mini and um, there was a lady on the other side and she was like somebody from the, you know the 1950s with the big hair bun up dress somebody like these tight sort of leopard skin trousers sort of leaning there on a, a, the car completely unconcerned and she was smoking a cigarette like this and then on the other side sitting in the, the door with the door open and just sitting there was this other lady um, dressed very similarly from some 1950s bebop movie or something but she had on her lap sitting there this massive green parrot who's about this big living parrot a yeah a living parrot and she was just sitting there like just tickling the parrot and she had some nuts and giving nuts to the parrot like this and I just looked at this and then, in the end and got in the car and you know carried on to the next place all kinds of weird mm, stuff that happens it's like it hits you because everything's everything's been upended even going into uh, the first town we went to north of Iwaki and we knew we'd been hit by the tsunami but we were driving down this road we got there late at night there were actually street lights it was very very quiet but everything looked picture perfect you know, all the, the lights were on, the houses, everything was fine, you know, trimmed bushes, everything was nice, you just drove down. It was like, maybe we got the wrong information. And then I remember just turning the corner in the car, and then, boom, it was like a, a giant's foot that just like stamped on the, everything that was there, you know, and it was, cars were up on the third floor, and there was all kinds of, you know, just destruction, cars everywhere, stacked up in piles. And, and then you'd, you'd g get past that, and then another, it's fine. And then, boom, it's another area. So it's everywhere where the tsunami reached, and then, went out again. That's very, very strange. It's very weird to, and then, uh, yeah. You find massive destruction everywhere. And I remember also the detail of a um, sitting in the middle of the road with all these smashed cars around it. It was like a, a glass, um, you know what you use in a kitchen to put um, cups and stuff, you know, the glass, what do you call it? Kitchen cabinet, you know. But glass and the cups. It was sitting there in the middle of the road completely untouched. And it's like, you know, and then there's a car above it in the third floor window, you know, it's like, really, it's really sort of, that's one of the things, it's very disorienting <coughs> in the area. But anyway, I think we will have to stop now, because unless there's no more, any more questions. But please read this information, uh, the stories. If you've got any questions, I've got a, a Meishi here. Please email me. I'll be happy to give any more information if you want. Or answer any questions you have. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks very much for coming. Yeah.